is also conditioning. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes that there are two kinds of souls. One is called conditioned and the other is liberated. The conditioned soul is subject to the three modes of material nature. The material energy is composed of three different modes which are called goodness, passion and ignorance. We commonly re refer to them as Rajagun, Tamagun and Sattvagun. So there are three different degrees of the material nature. Just like when you paint, those of you who use colors to paint, you, you begin with three colors. From three colors, red, blue and yellow, we can make many thousands of other colors, all different tones and combinations, shades. It all comes from three primary colors. In the same way, there are three primary modes of nature. Goodness, passion and ignorance. And these modes of nature interact to produce 8,400,000 different species of life. The fact that there are 8,400,000 different species of life is given to us from the Vedic literature. We accept the Vedas as our authority. Oh. It's important for us to accept sh scripture. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna also describes, Ya Shastra Vidim Utsrijya Vartate Kama Karata Na Sasadim Abhapnoti Na Sukam Na Parangati That if we doubt the scriptures, if we do not have faith in the scriptures, then we will never have we will never have success in our endeavors, we will never achieve perfection, and we will never achieve the supreme destination. So, it's very important for us to have faith in the words of Scripture. We give an example to understand why we should have faith in the Scripture. The example is just like a young child wants to know, who is my father? So there are many men in Dubai. We could go around all the men in Dubai and ask, are you my father? Are you my father? And we try to find the father. It will be very difficult to find the father by our own efforts. But the child can also go to the mother and ask, who is my father? And then the mother can immediately say, who is the father? So in the same way, the Vedic literatures are like a mother. They tell us everything about the Father. Father means God, the Father of all living entities. That Krishna is the Father of all living entities is also stated in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, Aham Bija Pradapita that I am the seed-giving father, not only of the human species, but of all species of life. We said 8,400,000 different species of life. And Lord Krishna is the seed-giving father of all the different varieties of life. So, we have to understand the special significance of the human form of life. Because in the human form of life, we have many facilities which are not there in other forms of life. In the human form of life, we enjoy, for example, uh, education. Schools are there. And there, are, there is hospitals. There is transportation and communication. So many different facilities are there for the human beings. They're not really meant for the animals, or the plants, or the trees, or the fish. Although sometimes some facilities may be used, but generally these facilities are human, made, for, made by humans for the convenience of humans. 
So the human body enjoys many facilities unique to the human body, unlike the other different species of life. Why is the human body, why does the human have so many more facilities? The example is given that just like in a government office, the highly placed officer will enjoy more facilities than the ordinary office worker. Because the highly placed officer is responsible for the efficiency of the department and he has to make sure there is no corruption. So he will be rewarded that he is taking a greater responsibility. So with responsibility comes facilities. We have, in the same way in our human form of life, we are given facilities, we should recognize also the responsibilities which are there. Responsibilities which come with the human form of life. And these responsibilities begin with inquiry into the Absolute Truth. With inquiry, just simply to understand our own identity. Who am I? And why am I here? Where will I go at the time of death? We all know that death is there for everyone. Where do we go? What happens at death? We should understand this science, this knowledge. This knowledge is available to us, particularly in the Vedic literatures, like Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita explains to us the science of the soul. Education today, we see uh, the, they have wonderful establishments, they build big uh, buildings, nice look, they look very nice for the educational purpose, but they are simply concerned with material knowledge. They do not give any spiritual education. They simply they, they educate us in the matter of sense gratification. Modern education, <coughs> material education, is simply the culture of avidya. Not actual real knowledge, it's avidya which we're learning. Mm -hmm. Just like someone we say, you can do a when graduate study, get the MA, and we say, Master of Avidya. <laughs> yeah. everyone, everyone wants to be a master, but in spiritual practice, we learn to be servant, not master. The spiritual science is teaching all of us how to be the servant, and that is more important. Being the, what are we the master of? Actually, we, we master some tiny aspect of material knowledge. It's not a great achievement. But people put a lot of emphasis on it. People spend a fortune for education these days. And people will take loans from the bank. And they will pay back the money for the rest of their life just so their children can get education, what they think is good education. But that education is all related to the body, and it's not going to help them at the time of death. So we have to understand that Krishna consciousness is an education in the science of the soul, and this education will save us from the miseries of material life. It will allow us to learn how we can overcome the forces of material nature. Instead of being the slave of the material nature, we can transcend the material forces. Material forces are there in the form of lust, anger and greed, illusion, madness, envy, these kind of things, they're not very pleasant things. They're not very nice. We'd, 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 we'd like to avoid them if we can. Just like you see when Lord Krishna appeared in this world, Lord Krishna came as the eighth child of Vasudeva and Devaki. 
the first six children of Vasudev and Devaki were all killed by who killed? Who killed the first six children? Kamsa. Yeah, Kamsa. The, 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 uh, the brother of uh, Devaki. Because he had heard that the, the eighth child of Vasudev and Devaki is going to kill him. So he was instigated by Narada Muni that you have to do something. You better take action. So when Devaki gave birth to children, one after another, Kamsa killed them. And it is significant that six children appeared in the womb of Devaki and were killed one after another. This indicates to us that before Lord Krishna appears, first of all, they have to remove the, the evil characteristics of the material world. These six sons who were killed by Kamsa, they represent lust, anger, greed, illusion, madness, envy. So these things are all removed. Because when Lord Krishna is going to appear, Lord Krishna is the supreme absolute truth, completely pure. And there's no question of any impurities when Lord Krishna comes, and where Lord Krishna appears. So therefore the first six children were killed. And then Lord Balaram came. And Lord Balaram is also God. He's the brother of God. He's also the, the personality of Godhead. But he comes in the mood of being the servant. Lord Balaram, although he is equal to Krishna in every, every respect, he comes to show all of us the, 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 the wonderful uh, nature of serving the Supreme Lord. That Lord Balaram appears first in the womb of Vasudev and Devaki. And Balaram makes sure everything is ready for Lord Krishna to come. Before Lord Krishna comes, first of all, Lord Balaram comes. Just like before the, the, before the king comes, before the ruler comes, first of all, his minister will come, his private secretaries will come, and they will make sure everything is arranged, everything is ready for the appearance of the ruler. So in the same way, before Lord Krishna takes birth, first of all, Lord Balaram appears. And then Lord Krishna, of course, Lord Balaram did not remain in the womb of Vasudev and Devaki. He transferred himself to the womb of Rohini. And then Lord Krishna came as the eighth child of Vasudev and Devaki. So I'm, I'm narrating this because I want you to understand that there are things, unwanted things in this, in this world. And these things are there in the form of lust, anger and greed illusion, madness, and envy. And if we can remove these things, we'll, we will be a better person for it. How to overcome these characters, these qualities which are within us? This is the science of Krishna consciousness. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes, for example, the nature of lust. The he, he, Lord Krishna mentions that lust is the all-devouring sinful enemy and it burns like fire and it's never satisfied. Not a very pleasant thing. How to overcome it? Lord Krishna then explains that we can overcome this lust by regulating the senses. By regulating our senses. And by process of sense control, then we can purify this, this uh, powerful enemy in the form of lust. So this is re regulation of the senses. You can see this is yoga practice. Bhagavad Gita is teaching yoga. And there are different kinds of yoga. There are different... Uh, natures, some people perform what is called karma yoga, means the yoga of action. And 
Karma yoga means uh, working, doing our duty, what is expected of us, but doing it in a detached manner, doing it without attachment. That is not so easy. Because the, our nature is that, as I said, we are conditioned souls. And we are conditioned to being attached. We, we will identify with something as belonging to us. Conditioning is thinking, I am this body, and then we, are, we go on to think, this is mine, this belongs to me. Are simply referred to as aham and mamiti. I and mine. This is a bodily conception of life. In Krishna consciousness, from the teaching of Bhagavad Gita, we learn that we are not the body, but we learn that we are all souls living in the body. And we learn that actually nothing is ours. Everything belongs to Krishna. It's all meant for his pleasure, for his enjoyment. And whatever we have, it is given to us by him. And this body is also given to us by the grace of God. So this, this is the basic teachings of the Bhagavad Gita to understand that everything belongs to God and it's meant for His pleasure. We have to learn how to use everything for the pleasure of the Supreme. Just like we have a tongue. We can use the tongue to speak many things. But in Krishna consciousness, we like to use the tongue to chant the names of God particularly to chant the Hare Krishna mantra. When we use our tongue in this way, then it generates a spiritual atmosphere. There's a special atmosphere generated through the chanting of the holy names of God. And that atmosphere is not of this material world. It's spiritual. It's spiritual in the sense that it purifies our consciousness. It takes our consciousness away from the temporary material and it brings our consciousness to the spiritual, to the eternal. Spiritual means not only eternal, but it means also full of knowledge and full of bliss. The spiritual nature is Satchit Ananda, eternal, full of bliss and knowledge. But the material nature is just the opposite. The material nature is temporary, ignorant and full of misery. This is the nature of the material world. We may say, well, I'm happy, I'm, not, I'm, I'm feeling fine, I'm not suffering in this world. That's now, right at this moment, but we don't have to wait long. Miseries come. The nature of this body is it's going to bring some troubles for us. Because everyone has to get old. Everyone suffers with some kind of disease and no one can live forever. So suffering is inevitable in this world. When, if we are conscious of the body, we're going to suffer more. But if we learn to change our consciousness from the body to the soul, then we can relieve ourselves of all of the miseries of life. We have to learn how to develop this consciousness of the soul. And it comes about by practicing the principles of yoga. As we said, there is karma yoga, the yoga of action. It means doing whatever is our duty. Someone is working, someone is a housewife, a mother, so we do whatever 
duties are expected of us, and, but we have to do them in the consciousness that we are doing them for the pleasure of the Supreme. And, and that we should do them without being attached to the results. Krishna describes in the Bhagavad Gita, the Karma Yoga, he said, Karmani eva dikaraste mapali shukadachana na karma palahi turbur mati sangosva karmani. Lord Krishna is speaking to Arjuna, and Arjuna is on the battlefield. And Arjuna doesn't want to do his duty. Arjuna is thinking he doesn't want to fight. And Krishna spoke this verse to him, telling him that he should do it. Because if he does his duty in that manner, he will not suffer any reactions. Arjuna was worried about sinful reactions. That was one reason why he didn't want to fight. So Krishna wants to encourage him to fight. Krishna tells him that if you do your duty in a detached manner, you won't get any reactions. That is the beauty of karma yoga. That when we work in a detached manner, we don't suffer the reactions from the work. But the more we are attached, the more we suffer. The more we are attached, it means the more we are trying to enjoy. We are trying to enjoy independently of Krishna, of the Supreme. We are trying to enjoy what is not actually ours. We said, in spiritual science, nothing is ours. We are the servants. Our duty is to serve. And similarly, we are not the enjoyer. We are meant to be enjoyed. We are subordinate to God, to the Supreme. When, so karma yoga is working in this kind of consciousness. Krishna told Arjuna, you have a right to do your duty, but you are not entitled to enjoy the results of your activity. That takes all the pleasure out of working. And if you have to work and you're not entitled to enjoy the results, why should you bother to work? That shows how, how attached we are to enjoying. But karma yoga is teaching all of us detachment. The results are not for us. The results are there, they're given. So we can, we can accept what we need, don't accept more than we actually need. This is a, the principle described in the Ishopanishad, right? that everything animate and inanimate is controlled and owned by the Lord. One should accept, therefore, only those things necessary for himself and should not accept more knowing well to whom they belong. This is the principle of God consciousness, recognizing that God or Krishna is the proprietor. Everything belongs to Him. And whatever is given to us, we should use it in the service of Krishna. That, that is, this is God consciousness. So karma yoga is working, the higher than karma yoga is, uh, the, the more one becomes detached, the more he cultivates knowledge. Actually knowledge will, not, will lead to more detachment. So it leads to jnana yoga. Another kind of yoga is the yoga of knowledge. With knowledge we are more detached, but with, with more knowledge we are less inclined to work. The action will not be there. One will want to give up work. But one can also work with knowledge. Some people have knowledge, they don't like to, they stop all activities. That is not good. Rather, with knowledge we can still continue to work. So knowledge, understanding, 
I'm not the body, that I'm a soul, understanding how there are unwanted things in our heart, like lust and anger and greed, and understanding how the mind works, how our mind can be a friend and our mind can be the enemy, learning how to control the mind. So this is all knowledge, this is jnana. And when this knowledge is in relation to God, to Krishna, then it is jnana yoga. And that knowledge, from that knowledge we learn that God is in our heart. And then we will think about meditation. And we will come to dhyana yoga, the yoga of meditation. Because we know the Lord is in our heart. We're not the body, we're all souls. So we will want to meditate on the soul. Right? And we will, we will absorb our con concentration on this. But when our meditation is perfect, we will realize that there is not one soul, but there are two souls. And those one soul is our individual self, the jiva, and the other is the paramatma, the supreme soul or the super soul. So this, this meditation is perfected when we see that we have a relationship with the super soul and that leads to bhakti yoga or the yoga of devotion we should understand that we're not god but we are the servant the jivatma has a relationship with the paramatma and we want to act in that relationship that is bhakti yoga bhakti yoga is based on it begins with Hearing and chanting, Shravanam and Kirtan. Hearing is a very important part of spiritual awakening. Just like in, when, we, when we take rest, when we go to sleep, sometimes we, we need an alarm clock to wake us up. You know, maybe these young ladies, when you have to go to school, right, you go early in the morning, so, not very easy for you to wake up in the morning, is it? Yeah, yeah difficult. They both agree. Yeah. <laughs> difficult to wake up in the morning. So, how do you wake up? Your mother will call you, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, mother wakes up. Your mother gets up and she gets the children up. You've got to get up. You've got to go to school, right? So the sound of the mother waking, that gets, they hear the mother's voice and they, oh, mother's here, I have to get up, right? If mother didn't come, you'd probably sleep all day, huh? <laughs> so, like that, we are asleep, we are also sl sleepy, we are forgetful of our real identity, we are thinking, I am the body. But by hearing the Bhagavad Gita and by chanting the names of Krishna, it is awakening our spiritual consciousness. We are becoming more aware of who we are and we are becoming more inquisitive to understand why we are here and what's happening. Why am I suffering? I want to enjoy. I want to be happy. Why am I not happy? So, that is the awakening of our spiritual consciousness. When we become more inquisitive to understand the nature of our existence and the nature of this world. We have to hear, we have, but we have to hear from the proper source. Just like we said, we hear from the mother. Mm -hmm. The mother knows everything about the father. Remember I said the example, who is my father? And the mother can tell. So the, the script, we have to hear from the scriptures. And they tell us everything about who we are, why we are here. And they tell us also who is God. And they tell us how we can also know God. So th this is very important for all of us, that hearing, and then hearing 
along with chanting. Chanting is not only chanting the Maha Mantra and prayers, but also speaking about Krishna, discussing topics of Krishna. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes the activities of the devotees by saying, Machitamagata uh, prana bodayantas parasparam katayantas katayantas chamanityam tushyanti cha ramanti cha. The, the thoughts of my devotees dwell in me. Their lives are surrendered unto me, and they derive great satisfaction in bliss by enlightening one another and conversing about me. Devotees like to hear and chant. They like to discuss topics of Krishna. There are two kinds of topics, two kinds of kata. One is called Gramya kata, and the other is the Krishna kata, right? So in the gram, in the Nadar Adi Gram, we want to spread the, the holy name to every town and village. So what is that Gramya Kita? You, you know, just like the village ladies, they'll go to the well or they go to the river to wash the clothes and they talk to the other women. And what are they talking, you know? They're not talking about the stock market. <laughs> they're not talking about the, the gold prices. but. They talk about other ladies, other people in the village, you know. This is all Gramya Kata. But Krishna Kata is the, the alternative. Material, mundane talking, mundane talk breeds mundane thoughts, breeds nonsense action, breeds old age, disease and death. That kind of Gramya Kata keeps us in the material world. We're not going to get, we're not going to progress in our consciousness by Gramya Kata, by nonsense talk. But Krishna Kata, when we speak about Krishna, when we discuss topics of Krishna, then these, these topics enlighten us and they change our consciousness from the mundane, from the material to the spiritual. So, just like in Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a nice example. We were just discussing in the car coming here, we were talking about Lord Kapila. Lord Kapila was the son of Devahuti. Now Devahuti was a nice young woman. She was the daughter of Swayambhuva Manu. Her father was Manu, big man, he's the emperor of the world. But she married a great yogi called Kardama, Kardama Muni. And he was living in the forest, in the jungle. And she'd been living in the palace with her father. But she heard about this man, Kardama, and she was told that, you know, this man would be a good husband for her. So she said, yeah, I want to marry this man. The, her father took her to the forest and left her there in the jungle, in the middle of the jungle, where the, the sage was, where he had his ashram. And so she was there, princess, and now she's living in the forest, and she was doing a lot of austerities. Do, and they did a lot of austerities for a long time. But then, Kardama Muni used his yoga powers and created a big mansion. And he took her to visit many different places, and they went all over the heavenly planets. They went to the places where all the demigods go to enjoy. You know, where do we go when you want to enjoy? Uh, I know in Hong Kong they have a Disneyland. You know, people like to they think Disneyland. We'll take the children to Disneyland. They'll enjoy there. You know. Where do you go to enjoy? You know, you go to some in Malaysia. In Malaysia they have a hill station. They have a hill station, and people will go to the hill station, and they will enjoy. Of course, there's a casino there also. You know, so, and they're thinking we'll enjoy there. You know. So, people have different places where we go to enjoy. Kardama Muni and Devahuti, they went places we cannot even imagine to go to. Okay, you can go to Los Angeles and enjoy Los Angeles. You can go to Hawaii, you know. The Japanese, they like to go to Hawaii. 
We think they can enjoy there. Some people come to Dubai to enjoy. Can you imagine it? <laughs> How can you enjoy in the desert? What is here in the desert to enjoy? <laughs>